And next up is a music video that I made uh, in 2011 uh, with a musician, a uh, rapper, and the song was about immortality. And uh, I just, it was something I was interested in anyway, so I explored it in this film. So me and a South African artist called Philip Rayford Johnson, uh, we made this film, I think 2013. And it was, it was basically an attempt at kind of just getting together and making something with zero budget in his hometown. Um, and it was an act of basically through science fiction unlocking doors that we could never normally um, get through and meeting lots of people who also loved science fiction, uh, like Sabir, the, the healer, who was a big, um, big sci-fi fan and was completely, you know, really excited about getting involved and kind of all the actors we got in, involved. And it was just a, a really great way of, um, through making and through science fiction, unlocking a city which has a lot of stereotypes uh, about it um, and then I guess you could say it was a, it was a science it's not really a science fiction film it's more of a science fiction collage so we took Johannesburg as uh, a source of places and people and and kind of way, ways way, places we can go go and go and, and meet people and then we also you know there's a science fiction is one big pot of tropes um, and, and material that's constantly recycled. It's like a one big shared vocabulary. Um, and so we just, we picked three or four of those, the, the most kind of standout, obvious ones like gold, gold colored robots and, and mysterious black cubes and kind of chucked them in a mixing pot and then spent a, a while editing and then there we have a sci-fi. <laughs> So, um, not only am I not a filmmaker, but I also have a confession to make, and that is that I'm not a science fiction buff. Um, so, science fiction fans usually have a kind of a problem with this, you know, they're historically really enthusiastic. Um, and I am actually a bit of an interloper into the field, so you guys can educate me. So, what I'm interested in is experimental writing and filmmaking from the Middle East and North Africa, so exactly what you guys do. And when I first started my PhD, I started with uh, an interest in representations of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And that's why I'm pretty giddy to be sitting next to Lar Larissa Sansour, whose work has been really important in this field. Um, so I won't wax lyrical about her work, but uh, at least you'll get to see some of her work after me. So 
from that region, there is a lot of autobiography and memoir and poetry, uh, which discusses kind of issues of conflict, exile, and dispossession. But the level of experimentation in more recent writing is what interests me. And those narratives tend to kind of slip into the fantastic and the surreal, even though they don't self-identify as science fiction. Um, kind of using a lot of the well-known points of reference that you mentioned just there, men in gold suits, this kind of thing. So an, an example of this is Raja Shahada. I've got an image of one of his books, if you can. So one of the authors uh, who I think is a good example of this is Raja Shahada. And you may have heard of him. He's actually been very successful um, in, in English translation. So he's a writer and a lawyer, and he talks a lot in his books about um, experiences of um, Israeli settlement in Palestine, which controvert international human rights law. So um, his books are filled with kind of statistics and detailed factual information, but they also have these really odd, surreal, dreamlike episodes. So he talks about being haunted by the ghost of his dead father and kind of going into a mental trance when he's walking in the hills in Ramallah in the West Bank where he's from and kind of likens the idea of Israeli settlements to a never, never land. So those things obviously like, should be out of place in his kind of memoir, but they're not. And I found myself really drawn to those kind of narratives that seem to represent reality as quite surreal and, and unreal and more science fictional. But I suppose we wonder like, why, why this trend? Um, why science fiction? Um, and one answer to, to this is provided by a science fiction author that I study. And his name is Yasser Bajat, and Larissa knows his work quite well. Um, so he, I don't have an image of him, unfortunately, but he has a really good TED talk about what he thinks about, about science fiction and why it's important. It's really easy to find. So he thinks that there's a direct correlation between science fiction uh, produced in a society and research and development coming from that society. So in theory, he's interested in like the hard science of science fiction. And he talks a bit about things like how Jules Verne basically envisioned the internet before, decades before we, we ever could use it the way we can now. So he thinks that if science fiction can do that, it can envision a totally different future. And uh, he's actually a computer engineer by profession, but he was willing to show this by example. So he set up his own publishing company called Yeta Kayalun. Um, it stands for, or it loosely translates to uh, their imagining. And he published his first book and it became a bestseller in Saudi. Um, I think it's, it's considered kind of the first Saudi Arabian science fiction novel. Um, so he uses a, a Jinni narrator using a well-known kind of Arabic character figure. And he talks a lot about the differences he observes between the human world and kind of a, an alien or invisible world. Um, but this didn't go unhindered. So he was accused by a Facebook reviewer of uh, promoting blasphemy and devil worshipping. And what ensued was a ban by Saudi's religious police, so the commission of the um, promotion of virtue and the prevention of vice. Um, I think it's quite like a science fictional thing in general for that, exist, for that to exist. Um, but nonetheless, uh, this happens a lot with bans, um, that it actually just increased support for the book. So some of the religious police read it and liked it, and the ban was lifted. So that kind of optimism is an unflinching optimism in a very hostile publishing environment, and that's not always characteristic of all the science fiction I've encountered, and I'd be interested in what you guys think about that as well. Um, so another one of the authors that I study, who's really important to my research, is called Ahmed Khaled Taufik. And probably nobody here would have heard of him, but he's a household name in Egypt. Everyone I know my age grew up reading his books and are completely obsessed with his... Uh, oh yeah, here we go, we're live. It's the next one, the next guy. Yeah, this guy. Um, so there I am, fangirling hard beside him. And uh, he's very famous with people from, uh, from kind of my age group in Egypt. Um, so the first of his novels to be, or the first of his works to be translated, even though he's got hundreds and hundreds of pieces of writing, is also his only novel, this one, Utopia. So that was published in Arabic in 2009, and it was picked up and translated to English in 2011. So this is the English language book cover, and you can tell from the look of it that it's pretty grim in terms of its content. So it imagines a gated community called Utopia, which has segregated itself from the, majority, the poorer majority of the population. And interesting fun fact, there is actually a gated community called Utopia in Egypt, um, which is privately owned. Um, so he envisions uh, this society becoming more and more divided because of kind of dispossession and um, monopolization of resources. 
And uh, it doesn't take like a lot of a huge leap to see the parallels between this kind of scenario and what later ensued two years later in uh, Egypt in terms of the 2011 uprisings. Um, so at the end of the novel, big spoiler alert, uh, the dispossessed majority stage an uprising um, against the, the gated community, but we're left uncertain as to how it succeeds. And again, we could say that we're still uncertain about what has, what has ensued with 2011, whether or not a success has, has ensued. So it's pretty dystopian, despite the name. Um, but it was very popular, and um, it resulted in, obviously, his first translation, but also a real emphasis on the ability of science fiction to predict the future, um, uh, based on the, the time of writing. So those two examples are vastly different, and you might wonder why, why I've kind of chosen those two. Um, so the content of each is really different, and the a kind of level of experience that both writers had is really different, and the past publication is also much easier for one of them. They are contemporaries, but they come from two different parts of the Middle East, so they're probably not known to each other. Um, but they're two examples of a lot of work that's come out of the, of the region generally, which is focused on science fiction. Um, one way we might think about that is how there are plenty of contemporaries like Jules Verne and like H.G. Wells who never cross paths, but they're considered like founding forefathers of Anglophone science fiction. Um, so, if we think about a golden age of science fiction um, in terms of what's available in English, we kind of think about the turn of the 20th century and like an obsession with a technocratic modernity. So people are kind of really worried about what was going to happen in terms of technological and scientific development. And a lot of the science fiction authors like foresaw this. Um, like Jules Verne foreseeing the internet, if you will. And it, that kind of thing is emphasized by a lot of science fiction fans as a particular power of science fiction, the ability to predict the future and to innovate te techno technological development. But for me and the text that I research, what's important is the illumination of the present. So what they can tell us about the world we inhabit now. And the two texts that I've shown you have, have an obvious interest in an imagined future, but they use material very much rooted in the present to construct that. So I think we can see that it's quite obvious in terms of Taufik's texts, the kind of society that he was pulling from in, in, in terms of creating a fictional world which is troubled by class divides and monopolization of resources and an autocratic regime of power. And there are kind of sim similar critiques of the human world in, uh, in Bajat's novel. Kind of a character which stands on the outside and looks in and critiques what's there in front of him. Um, and um, somebody who does this very well is actually Larissa. And I was going to talk a little bit about her, uh, her film Nation Estate, which envisions a kind of a dystopian solution to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. Um, and to me, there's nothing more urgent than that situation, nothing more present and more realistic. So I'm going to skip on a little bit because I think we have only a couple of minutes. Yeah. And talk a little bit about, um, I suppose, what these texts are confronting. So not only are they confronting kind of challenges in the local environment, but also the pushes and pulls of the publishing industry. And in the case I've mentioned, the trials and tribulations of translation. And that's really different to what you guys study when you have kind of, you don't have the same um, issue with translation and language. So science fiction has been well known um, as a kind of a subversive genre, something that's countercultural. I think everybody here has an interest in science fiction probably for that reason. And certainly the two texts of like their experience of the publishing industry is really unpredictable. One has done much better than the other. Um, Taufik's book, because of kind of an English speaking audience interest in the Arab Spring, is going to be like adapted into a film. Um, and we might see how similar that is to some of the, the films that, that you guys are, are interested in. Um, but I think I uh, just want to like wrap it up a little bit um, on that note is that I think that understanding the different paths that these texts have taken um, to travel and reach an English speaking audience shows that science, the act of writing science fiction is a radical one so not only are those, those authors challenging um, kind of publishing conventions but also different issues of regulation and censorship like rooted in a really um, kind of difficult social and political environment. And I think we need the stories of those books as well as the ones that they tell us in the books because they can tell us so much more about the world around, around us than they can perhaps about a future that we might imagine. So um, I suppose what my research tries to emphasize is that 
science fiction certainly still has the capacity to envision the future. Some very dystopian future images for, for you guys. But it also has the ability to turn our heads to social and cultural and political realities right here in the present. So. Thanks a lot, Sinead. There's something about sci-fi and um, its ability to form a parallel universe to uh, the political reality that, say, I come from. Um, when um, the situation on the ground becomes a bit actually more surreal than uh, fiction itself, it's very hard to keep on doing documentaries like I used to do in the past. And I think the more Palestinians uh, take on the role of an author instead of, uh, say, somebody who is part of a documentary, the more power it lends to that voice. And I think that's the biggest problem in the narrative is that there is a, there, there needs to be a power twist. And I'm very interested in my work in power relations. And I think when you talk about sci-fi and say progress, you're immediately in that seat where you, you take on that power. You, you're there to impress, not to have people feel sorry for you. And I think that's the problem is that I don't want people to come and look at the, a Palestinian story and feel, oh, that's very sad for them and we want to help, but we don't know how to help. So um, I think for me that, that becomes a, a master and servant relationship and I think, uh, or a charitable relationship. And I, more interested in making films that impress people so you actually have the desire to watch. Um, and there's more to sci-fi that, um, that one can easily talk about all night, but um, I think we were showing Nation Estate now, a film that I made in 20, uh, 2012, and uh, it's a direct uh, comment on what's happening in f to Palestinian cities at the moment. Um, a, I come from Bethlehem in, in Palestine, and every time I go back home, uh, I see that the settlements are completely zero, zeroing in on the city. So they're choking the city, and, every, and all cities in, in Palestine are becoming like open-air prisons. So this is um, a sci-fi interpretation of... Um, I guess what sci-fi has is this ability to talk, to, um, to talk about what the future will look like, if we let it, if we let things continue the way they are, so it has this kind of uh, it, it always it's ominous. It always has a, a warning for the dystopia that we we might uh, have. Um, so maybe we should watch the film and we can talk about it later. Yeah, thanks. In this film, um, basically, Palestinians uh, get um, permission to uh, have their own state, but on condition to have it in one small area. So because there is a, a big problem with the amount of areas that um, Israel keeps taking from Palestinian land, um, it seems that the future would just if you think about a viable Palestinian state, it seems the only way that it could exist would be one huge skyscraper housing in all the Palestinian population and all the cities. So in this film, you see every city being replicated on each floor. And it's almost a joke that actually all the, the, the known places in those cities are actually remade uh, for every floor and then all the problems that Palestinians are facing right now would just disappear because Palestinians can just take the elevator from one city to another. They don't need to take, go through checkpoints because at the moment, Palestinians have to go through Israeli checkpoints to just travel. So traveling is a big, big problem in Palestine and the film does open with, with this, um, uh, with showing that Palestinians actually have, in order to 
to get to Palestine, they have to go to Jordan. So that's why the film starts with a man express. Um, and it's a journey that I have to take every time when I have to go to uh, Palestine because I'm not allowed to go to Tel Aviv airport. Uh, so Israelis don't allow Palestinians to just go through Israeli airport. So a journey that would have taken me five hours from London to Israel actually takes me a day and a half because I have to go through Jordan and then uh, go through a lot of harassment when I'm crossing the bridge from Jordan to Palestine. So what the, uh, the peace proposes is um, that Palestinians will, have, will live such a high uh, life in a high-tech building where they can just take a 15-minute express train from Amman to Bethlehem. So, so life is just amazing in this building, but as you can see, it, it ends with it being surrounded by the Israeli wall. So it's just another form of, you know, uh, another form of prison. Um, I'm, I'm, there's so much to talk about, so maybe I'll just, uh, um, I'll, I'll see if you have questions or. <laughs> I've actually, um, like, I've actually always found it interesting um, watching that film many times. Um, kind of how eerily, sort of, without the music, how eerily quiet the whole thing is. It's very expansive. Um, and as you say, it has that power to like visually impress as a spectacle, but also just by the lack of those checkpoints can kind of show how much that would define like a, a normal route of travel, um, like in your experience and I imagine in everyone's experience going back to Palestine. Um, so it's as much about what's not shown as what is there is, is what's kind of striking to me. You know, um, I wonder how specific that is to a Palestinian experience or maybe I don't know for you if that comes across in South African material as well, you know. <laughs> I, was I mean, it's really obvious why, but I was wondering if you could talk about the CGI. And it'd be interesting to see the film made um, without CGI. And obviously there'd be political ramifications or it'd be very difficult to access all the shots that you, you end up having to CGI because a lot of the CGI that you did could be replaced by in-camera shots. Yeah, um, uh, obviously the scene in Bethlehem would have been nice with just an aerial shot and uh, would then be, uh, I'm not sure if people know, but the, when I get off the Bethlehem floor, I actually um, uh, walk through the Nativity Church, which is basically the, uh, the attraction of Bethlehem. Uh, so Nativity Square um, is redone in, in, in the film where you see some more futuristic features, but that could have been much easier if I didn't have to replicate the whole Nativity Square, which I did in this situation. There's a lot of restrictions when you go to, through Israel because um, you, you go through a very intensive search. I've never seen anything like this anywhere else in the world. Um, and often your material could get confiscated. So if I would bring a whole crew that will be interrogated or strip searched or I don't know what uh, they will, would do to them and then we would film on this very expensive camera and then have all of our stuff confiscated, that would have been a disaster. So a lot of it is actually CGI. So the only scenes that are not CGI are shot in Denmark or, uh, and in the metro in Denmark because it's quite futuristic. But uh, all the Palestinian cities have been just replicated to the T uh, with CGI, and that's what made it so costly. Um, yeah. It's interesting because normally CGI is reserved for aliens, but the situation is so alien that you have to spend all that money just to replicate a situation that actually exists in the real world. Um, talking about the way things are made, I wonder if you could talk about how you drew your whole vision. Like, did you, is it like, are you drawing over frames of images or is that all, it just yeah. seems so organic the way the film kind of moves through that vision that you made? Yeah, that was done uh, using pencil drawings. Uh, just like every second of animations, about 12, 12 drawings. So I'm just tracing it again and again and like moving it slightly. Uh, that's why it took nine months to finish, and it was supposed to be three months, but anyway. 
did you know what you were drawing before you started? Or is it, but does it like change the drawing it? Uh, no, because it's such hard work. You don't want to like change anything or do anything again. So like everything was storyboarded like shot for shot pretty much. And actually it was easier because then I've done films like just on their own and then like try to add a soundtrack after or something. But working with a music video was like way easier because you already have like the time and the pace and everything set. So it was actually quite easy and enjoyable to do because you had like a, a rhythm and I don't know, I think it made it a bit, a bit easier in that respect. Hi, uh, we have two roving mics, um, Seneca and Angela. Um, any other questions to Larissa, Dave, Sinead, Gareth, lots of films, lots to talk about, I'm sure. Please make yourself known. And um, hi, so, yeah, I was just wondering about kind of, because um, the, the thing I really love about sci-fi is the fact that it is, feels so kind of close to our lives, but has this just completely surreal, can have this completely surreal element to it. So I was wondering about, what you felt about its capacity to kind of break down power dynamics and kind of flows of oppression and whether there's there's a way of kind of building empathy between oppressed people and the oppressors or if not empathy then making people kind of realize and internalize those power dynamics through sci-fi through sci-fi kind of tropes and presentations So everyone have a go. Um, yeah, I, I, I mentioned this in the beginning because um, that's exactly what I try to do in my work because often you see the Palestinian as the downtrodden or somebody who needs sympathy and you need to help them but you don't know how and then it just becomes such a problematic relationship in general. So um, I think when you uh, contextualize Middle Eastern politics in a sci-fi genre, it, you all of a sudden become um, somebody that inhabits that powerful uh, position. And um, because we associate sci-fi with progress and the future. And so once you start working with these kind of elements, it just be you become a more interesting voice to listen to. And I think I particularly find that for me this is quite important because I'm very, very tired of talking about what's happening uh, in Palestine and the injustice and uh, human rights violations by the State of Israel. And each time I say it in a very clear and kind of give facts about what's happening, the more I do, the less people believe me because people don't believe that a, a the, the only democracy in uh, the Middle East, Israel, could actually be um, um, accused of c these crimes because people don't see that uh, on the news. They don't really believe that it's coming from a person who's objective because I'm Palestinian and therefore I'm biased. So for me, sci-fi is a very comfortable place to be in and uh, I think a more powerful place to be in. Well, it's, it's, a <clears throat> it's the 500th year of the publication of Utopia this year. And you're talking about, you're talking about being in a show called Utopia and you're showing the Utopia and you're kind of displaying this kind of Palestinian Utopia. And, you know, what Utopia does is it, well, it creates a non-place. So it's, a, it, it's, a, it's, an, it's an opportunity for people to basically world build. So you can create a fishbowl and fill it with your own water and your own fish. And, and, uh, and then by doing that, you can, for a moment, think about, think about things separate from the now and the present. Um, so it's a, science fiction in that sense is a, can be a tool um, for different, um, different people to, to, to kind of use as a kind of way of, uh, thinking about different alternative um, alternatives to now. <laughs> I just have to share. Oh, no, there you go. Um, yeah, I like, I've, I'm glad you mentioned that about Thomas More. Um, there's like kind of celebrations everywhere, like commemorations everywhere of that book. 
Um, and it's interesting to think that after 500 years, people still have their own idea of what utopia looks like, and it's still so malleable. Like, it can change depending on every situation that you kind of place that trope in. It's like you said, it's like a part of a, a history of science fiction of, like, it's almost like stock tropes that you can just pull from and manipulate. And um, the thing about utopia is that the actual word is like, it's, there's a bit of wordplay. It means good place or no place. And I think, especially from even the work we were just looking at, you're always teetering on the balance between whether this non-place is a good place or not, and what's been defamiliarized and left behind, you know, in the creation of this bounded space, because it's kind of, it's only possible because other things have been caught outside of it, you know? Um, so I think it's always got this ability to, like, like you were just asking, kind of make us think about the structures that are in place to create that space and, and what kind of power relations are involved. Yeah. Any other questions? A good bunch of films. Um, please. Could you tell us a bit about what we're looking at on the screen, uh, Intergalactic Palestine? So this is a, a work that I did in six years ago with... Um, a collaboration uh, with another artist based here who's originally from Israel. So we did a, f a, a graphic novel trying to understand what the role of an artist is in a, in a political, um, politically conflicted uh, reality. Um, and it was very hard to understand um, how much of an influence really uh, we have as artists. And I guess this is a question that we always have in, in the art world. Why are we doing these political works? And we, we received questions as far as like, people asking us, is this, are you doing political work because it's trendy? And it's something that's really, really... Um, um, I, I, I was quite shocked when I heard, that, uh, I heard such a question because I think unless you come from a place that's completely torn apart by war, you really cannot possibly understand why people are working with these, uh, with these topics. And I think, um, for me as a Palestinian, this is such an urgent matter that I'm just trying to find a way of communicating this problem in different ways. So, uh, this novel was trying to actually talk about this problem. What, what, what is it as an artist can we do to... Uh, um, or, do we have an influence as artists? So you, you start the novel by um, following two artists that lose their artistic powers when they contract a, a weird uh, virus. And they um, slowly start turning into superheroes. So uh, they contact the lab that actually did, um, did, uh, did develop this virus and um, they try to go back to being artists. Uh, and slowly they realize that actually the lab cannot do that and that they are stuck in the superhuman form. So they decide to, um, um, to use their superhuman powers to um, uh, help Palestinians on the ground. So this, in a, in also it's, it's quite sci-fi in, in a very kind of, um, oh, you can't see it very well, but um, it, it tries to kind of uh, comment on what's happening in Palestine uh, just um, in a surreal way. So, for, for example, these super uh, heroes can uh, cross checkpoints just by flying over them. Um, they have a lot of... Um, abilities that they would not have if they were just artists. So, but, the, but the work really is just trying to talk about what is it that a superhuman power would have over being an artist. And in the end, we kind of realize that there is not much a superhuman being can do over an artist. So it's kind of really just um, talking about this di dichotomy and, and, and trying to kind of unfold it. Hamza, you had a question? 
Okay. Any, uh, Seneca, just behind you. Hi. Um, I just wondered, um, are your comics distributed in Palestine and are they um, available in other countries? This, this uh, particular work has caused a lot of problems. So basically we received a lot of hate mail because for a Palestinian to work with an Israeli, I have been uh, not very welcome to show this work in any Arabic country. And for an Israeli to work with a Palestinian and talk about uh, and be so pro-Palestinian and actually criticize uh, the Israeli state made it so unwelcome in Israel as well. So it's kind of considered extreme in that way. So we kind of sits in, in, in a no, no space. We, we do show it. Uh, we, we did have a big tour with it in America and in Europe. But the problem with that is that a lot of people are not very uh, okay with sanctioning it because it's really very, very critical of Israel. So it's, it, it's, it's kind of a problematic work. Um, thanks so much for showing all that great work. Um, talking about sci-fi, um, and technology. Uh, it's all some great sort of stuff of sort of virtual reality, sort of things flying through your work, etc. In terms of talking about sci-fi and technology, what do you think are sort of the next sort of things that artists like yourselves would like to talk about? So what I mean, some talk about like, you know, The Matrix was about virtual reality, you know, Star Wars is about space travel and robots and AI. It just seems like kind of now, it seems very weird now that we, you know, we've got Google who's already built their AI. We've got lots of sci-fi that's kind of come true. So what would be the next sci-fi? And what would be the next thing that would come true? Possibly. Uh, that's a, well, the thing with sci-fi is that it's all about making, uh, a good sci-fi is where the future's boring. So in the next science fiction, you know, 3D printers are just the same position as the microwave in the house. Um, in, in science fiction, when a spaceship goes to a space station, it's the same as a lorry delivering something to the supermarket. Um, so, as a kind of like, it's only really in kind of filmic sci-fi where you get this kind of fantastical, wow, look at this super flashy technology. Um, in true hard sci-fi, that kind of future technology is the stuff that um, kind of goes into the background. Um, so that's not an answer to your question, but I just... I, <laughs> um, I guess I'm interested in... Uh, I mean, a lot of technology is already here, but it's not everywhere at the same... Like, the future's arrived, but not for everyone. And that's something more interesting to explore than the actual technology. So that's kind of what I'm touching on in the film, the immortality animation, is that a super rich guy is like ready to live forever. Meanwhile, everyone's like completely screwed with war, inequality, oppression, everything like that. Um, it did interest me what you said about the difference with filmic sci-fi. Sci um, and I really agreed with what you had to say, Dave. I think that there, uh, there was kind of a certain like trend in the like 20th century, maybe in the earlier part of the 20th century, especially in narratives, towards um, science fiction really associated with like adventure novels. Um, so kind of the idea that there are places that were undiscovered and there's kind of a new and unde like kind of underdeveloped future that we were going to work towards. And it, it kind of reminds me of what Larissa was saying at the start about the, the association between science fiction and progress. And I think now there's been kind of a shift where there's a feeling like everything's already mapped and discovered. And now there's like an obsession with like futurism and kind of looking into an unknown future. But I think what everybody here is interested in is the idea of places that are unevenly mapped. So places that have been inaccurately mapped or that have been kind of um, discovered, but sort of uh, painted in a certain way that now needs to be like rediscovered or sort of um, re-envisioned. Um, and I think that's, a, that's exactly what you were saying, Dave. But I think it, it holds true for um, a lot of narrative science fiction as well as, as film as well. 